it's not so much, I think, a matter of there are thus and such many actual irreducible subatomic particles at a certain finite quantity existing in the universe, and so the possibilities are thus. Rather, the uh, the being of something, it's it's in insofar as it is an entity, it is an event, and it is defined by its correlation with and its collaboration with, again, to use that word, the other entities that are in play. I kind of wish that you were like the main, I, I, these are such good questions. Like the, the, I, I wish this is how all podcasts were. <laughs> Hello, Nathan. Hi. <laughs> so this is a very um, special podcast because I've been I've been following uh, Nathan uh, for a while and I really like uh, his work. And it's I mean, I, I guess this applies to all episodes to some degree, but it's always a bit odd when you kind of watch so much content of, of a person, you kind of admire them. And then having to speak with them uh, is a bit surreal. But Nathan is a bit of an, a special category compared to all my other hosts because a lot of my admiration comes from his artistic uh, endeavor, while a lot of my other hosts, uh, they're generally like academics uh, and, and stuff like that. And so Nathan is kind of a, I don't know, <laughs> he's, he's kind of, you know what, in some ways he fits, but in, uh, which we'll get into. But in some other ways, uh, they don't. Uh, but this this difference actually makes me uh, pretty excited, and I think it will make a very um, interesting episode. So, Nathan, thank you so much uh, for coming. Like, it's it's really a pleasure. My my pleasure to be here. I, I really appreciated the invitation. I was very excited. I mean, I've I've been following your account since I I actually can't remember how we connected or what it was that occasioned our connection. It, it's because I, I messaged you saying how awesome you are on Instagram, basically. <laughs> Okay, cool. All right. Happy to be reminded of that. But I just remember since that time, I've, I've always really been enjoying your content, your reviews, and the way that you're using, you know, your, your social media to be really thoughtful and analytical, but also very accessible, which is kind of the same niche that I'm trying to operate in, where you're creating a little node of information for people that is not difficult to access, you know, both functionally or intellectually, but is really of, of, of substance and you're, you're, you're doing that. So I, I, I really have been appreciating what you put out. The feeling is mutual. Thank you. I, I, I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, that, that kind of intersection between, uh, you know, deep content, but at the same, at the same time, you know, something easy to access, that's, that's definitely something that I'm trying to do. And that's, that's obviously pervades a lot of your work as well, although in a, in a different better dimension. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. I would say. So um, I doubt that most people listening to this will, will know who the hell you are. So maybe <laughs> so maybe just give a brief introduction. Like, who, who are you and the, what do you do exactly? Sure, yeah. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Nathan Dufour Oglesby, and I am a number of things. Uh, I'm a writer and a musician and uh, a video creator. Basically, I rap about really philosophical stuff a lot, and I also teach and do lectures and stuff like that. And so um, if, you know, you were ever looking for a song about uh, critical theory and how it works and what it is, or if you were looking for a song about how, uh, you know, economic ideologies affect our daily lives or something like that, I make songs about that kind of thing. And sometimes they're just from my own noggin. And other times they're commissioned by somebody or, or um, ordained by some sort of circumstance that calls for them. And so I, I make music on my own under the name Nathan Dufour, um, which is my first and middle name. And I also make music with my friend Hilla um, as Nate and Hilla. And in that second bucket, we make a lot of sort of environmental content. Um, so, yeah, basically that's, that's what I do. I, I, I ramp about ideas. Right. Um, which uh, I'm pretty sure that you're the first rapper here and you're very likely <laughs> going to be the last as well. 
Um, I, I doubt that. I doubt that. I actually do think that I'm part of a trend of uh, artistic response to to uh, ideological problems and to, and to how to present ideas. It's just the most efficient way to do it, you know, which is kind of, I don't know, maybe we'll touch on this later as things proceed, but to me, it's the oldest way of talking about philosophy just because most philosophical traditions begin in some sort of quasi-poetic or performative form, and it's high time that people start doing it again, and I think that they will, you know, it's what you're seeing on the internet anyway, so. So th this, th the musical aspect uh, of, of your work is actually something that I'm uh, quite fond of. It's also something that I, that I wanted to cover uh, right from the beginning. And you have, uh, you have an interest uh, in philosophy and you obviously have more than an interest in music. And I'm, I'm very interested about how those uh, interconnect, not only in, in your own work, but how they interconnect in, in, in reality, uh, so to speak. And so I've always been uh, a big aficionado uh, of music, even though musically I, I completely suck. Uh, my my girlfriend is a musician. Uh, she plays guitar. And I can't help but notice that you seem to be sitting by a piano. Yeah, she also plays some piano, but guitar is, is her thing. Um, and, and I love music, but like I've, I've tried to learn music theory and I, I just feel like, I don't know, like my intelligence just like inverts back to like a five-year-old or something like that. Uh, but it has always captivated me. I like. I find it very meaningful, uh, and I've always seen this this parallel uh, with philosophy, uh, which, in some sense, I would classify music within the broader category of art that serves this function uh, between philosophy. But I think music even has kind of like a, a peculiar peculiarity above the other arts, and I always feel that music kind of. In, in a lot of ways, kind of tries to express a lot of the deeper aspects of philosophy that you just can't do philosophy on, or at least not yet. It kind of, it's, mm. it's constantly uh, ahead of you, so to speak, uh, because philosophy needs to be articulated and kind of arts uh, is kind of, you, you can transmit something that can't be pro propositional articulated, at least, um, you know, in a complete sense so so i'm very curious about your own take how, how do you how do you view philosophy and music and how do those relate i i love how you frame that question um you you seem to have framed it as that art has the capacity to sort of cut to a certain type of expression or utterance or articulation quicker but not doing so in a demonstrative way or an argumentative way or propositional way as you put it and I think that that is true in a sense, but in a way, just to return to the point that I was making earlier, I, I think that if we're talking about Western philosophy, Western philosophy begins as a very artistic type of act because there was such, there was such a such a faint distinction and really no distinction at all between uh, the mode of wisdom transmission that poets were doing and that the early philosophers were doing. It was all a practice of Sophia. And it was happening in different contexts in the Greek world. You had the the symposiasts, the folks who met together in symposiums and you know small groups and were sharing poetry, but also sharing ideas. And the difference between a discourse that we would now categorize as philosophical and that would have been categorized now as lyrical was non-existent. It just depended on the topic that was being discussed and the mode of transmission, for various technological reasons and traditional reasons, was poetic. It was metered in the sense that it had poetic rhythm and it followed the conventions of poetry. They didn't have rhyme um, as a feature of their poetry just because it doesn't really make that much sense to rhyme in ancient Greek, but they you know, would have if they were doing it now, most likely. And the interesting thing there, I guess, for me is that just because you can submit an artistic expression to analysis or submit a philosophical idea, a wisdom idea to analysis, doesn't mean that its genesis is necessarily from analytical methods. You know, Plato is really good at taking the kind of questioning that Socrates was doing and systematizing it, or at least it would appear so. Because Socrates didn't write anything, so we don't know, you know, what he wrote or what, what he what he what he thought, um, you know, from from the horse's mouth, as it were. Uh, but Plato seems to begin. He gets the ball rolling on systematic analysis 
of, uh, of what we now call Socratic questioning or the Socratic method, because that's how he pr presents it. And then Aristotle, you could argue, as Plato's student, is even more analytical and even more systematic of a mind. And so he begins to read like philosophy as we know it right now, where you kind of feel like you're reading a textbook or you're reading a technical treatise of a certain kind. But really, those are the first iterations in the tradition that we have of, of that kind of philosophical literature. And we can tell because of how critical they're being that they're intentionally inventing that new aspect of, of the tradition. And that prior to that, it's always performative and always quasi-poetic. The, the, the treatises that we have from earlier bear those marks. And then, and then you know, that, that's really, that debate is so much of what gets the whole, the whole tradition started. As Plato concerns himself with going, okay, so it can't be that philosophy is just being... Uh, good at being good at being uh, poetically performative it can't be that there must be something more going on and then then he starts to tease out that distinction well i actually think that i would say that anything started with plato i'd actually say that started with uh, socrates and, and plato kind of formalized it because i think p part of socrates endeavor was kind of there's this performative um aspect of it uh, which is kind of like making something salient to you kind of make something meaningful like it, it grabs your attention and then there's like a dimension of something being true which in in, in modernity we kind of associate that uh with science and so uh I, th I think part of what socrates uh was trying to do is kind of to to bring those two together because if you have only salience if you have if you have only performance then mm -hmm. that can be rhetoric for example like you can you can make something really attractive but it's not true at all but at mm -hmm. the same time uh you can also say something true but something that doesn't have any relevance or salience mm -hmm. at all so for example you know like a chemistry uh textbook that, that's probably not going to get get you a lot of wisdom so i think what's what socrates was was trying to do is kind of nail that that junction which is wisdom as, as, as far as i'm concerned yeah, I, th I think we're in agreement. I, yeah, I, I mean, I was, I was drawing the distinction, and I guess suggesting that that begins with Plato only in the sense that what we have, when what we associate with Socrates, there is is Plato representing Socrates, and we do, we do see him making uh, very fine distinctions in Xenophon as well, since Xenophon also writes, you know, a dialogue starring Socrates, and then our only other example being Aristophanes, which is a very parodical and satirical version of Socrates. But we don't actually know, and you know, I, it's 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 fun to speculate about. My hunch, for whatever reason, is always that Socrates was probably working with the primordial elements of that type of fine distinction and analysis, and was certainly concerned with that general theme of how do we tell the difference, or just to summarize it, how do we tell the difference between the performative sophist or the vacantly performative sophist and the substantively performative philosopher or substan substantively eloquent philosopher, and where where's the difference there? And I'm sure he was concerned with that theme, but yeah, that that systematic breakdown of that, you know, does it is it something that Plato gleaned from Socrates and then really put into its full flowering form or what? Who knows? It'd be wonderful to know. Although it's also funny that kind of uh, Plato historically at least kind of starts this this new path in philosophy, uh, which we now more easily recognize. But at the same time, even Plato's form is actually. Uh, quite different than modern philosophy because the, totally. the, the most you know the most uh popular influential work was the republic which was still in dialogue like mm -hmm. almost no philosophical work nowadays is in dialogue and so he, he was and so even though it was kind of losing that performance aspect the performance is literally still there because he's trying for us to internalize the the characters like so, so that mm -hmm. it's not just you know we're not just passively consuming the content, which is, I think, kind of what the Greeks were afraid of, of, of writing in general. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And Plato had precisely that anxiety about writing, you know, that, that it had the capacity to corrupt and just as much as it did to instruct and the care that he puts into creating these dramatic worlds. It's not just it's not just a candy coating for the pill, you know. It's it's not just a way to make it enjoyable. First of all, because he, I don't think, would have been thinking of it in that those terms. I think since he comes from this tradition of the two being intertwined, 
what we would call artistic representation and, and philosophical argumentation, that it, not even a question that that's how he'd present his work. But I think furthermore, it's that it, it insulates it from being um, insincere and inauthentic since he was so concerned about the corruptive influence of you know, the singular speaker who's spouting some sort of persuasive truth that may or may not be grounded in actuality. And that getting at the truth is a dialectical and conversational process that you can't really express without showing the whole process itself. That's very well, well said. Um, so coming back uh, to music again, uh, something that, uh, that I would like to bring up is, and we might uh, differ here a bit, so I'm not exactly sure where this would go, but the I've, I would consider that art has has in some sense been decaying out of its own needs to constantly reinvent itself and revolutionize uh, itself. And you can see a, a, a trend that, um, especially after modernism, uh, and this I think this is especially seen in painting, uh, with with how the movements progress, but maybe that's just my bias of being more familiar with it. I'm not exactly sure how this applies to the other arts. Um, but you, it, it kind of basically tries to subvert the, the, the tradition that is uh, embedded in. Uh, and that, that obviously has artistic value because you don't want to you want you don't want to be fixed in the mm -hmm. past. But at the same time, I think that kind of puts the bias of introducing uh, variation uh, for its own sake. And I'm not a huge fan, generally speaking, uh, of modern music, some of it. Uh, and, and to me, uh, that kind of feels like um, a symptom of it. And I also, and I also see a parallel with this of, of philosophy, uh, which is this, this, this more recent need of, of just constant destruction and kind of tearing apart of what... Uh, comes previously and for example um, a way that I see this being played out uh, quite clearly for example is is hip-hop and so for example hip-hop is a is not my main genre that, that I listen to um, but uh, I like it but a, a lot of like the contemporary hip-hop um, I'm not a big fan of it um, and to me that kind of symbolizes um, a bit of of that decay so I'm a bit curious about how you view uh, the progression of arts and if you want, you can be more specific to music since you're a musician. Um, and if you see any connection uh, with the philosophical elements that I've mentioned. I kind of wish that you were like the main... I, I, these are such good questions. Like the, the, I, I wish this is how all podcasts were. <laughs> um, the uh, The... Oh, that's not, that's, it's, an, it's an interesting thing to think about. Well, I want to return to your 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 thoughts about hip hop. Like, do you love classic hip hop or like older hip hop? That some of it is near and dear to your heart and uh, no, stuff um, so. no, I, I don't want to I don't want to overplay it. Um, I, I'm not like I said, hip hop is not one of my main genres. Got it, got it. Like, it's not something that it's not something that I rarely uh, listen on my own. That I'm just gonna listen to it. Um, but if I encounter it for some reason, like I, I, I dig it, you know, it kind of, you know, it makes, <sighs> makes me going, so to speak. Um, I think there's, there's a lot of things at play here o on a general level. The thing that you're talking about regarding the, here's how I would frame it. The, the addiction to novelty or the, the aesthetic addiction to novelty of the constant desire for iconoclasm where we shatter, shatter the idols of whatever existed before whatever the tradition had offered before and make something completely new as though that novelty itself were the substance of art or the substance of or the pinnacle of of uh, articulate expression as, as though the quality of art were predicated on the ability to be new and unheard of there i do think there's a pernicious streak that goes through our culture now that i think is tied to the commodification of art because if i want to sell you something that you already have i have to convince you that i'm selling you something new 
And before we go into music, I would say the most salient example of this to me is in film and in, in the dramatic arts. We have so many shows that are essentially the same story. We have so many movies that are essentially the same story. And again, I'm a, I'm a classicist, so you know, ancient uh, Greco-Roman civilization is what I often use to analogize my experience, just because it's my field of study, um, you know, academically. But take take ancient drama, take take you know, Sophocles and and uh, and Aeschylus, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These were stories that folks would have been familiar with. Uh, the, uh, Sophocles is. Uh, audience would be familiar with the Oedipus story prior to encountering his representation of it. And maybe last year at the same festival, they saw a different version of the Oedipus story. And it's not so much about, oh shit, what's going to happen at the end? It's about how am I going to have this unfolded for me? And the trappings of the presentation are also very similar. It's, it's not so much about uh, what new thing will happen or what new technology will be revealed to me. But by what means, by what process of uh, utterances and events and representations will this myth be explored today? We share the myth and then we re-explicate it many times. And the excitement comes from the how, not the what. Compare that to modern drama. In modern drama, at least if we're talking about a television show, is always predicated on you not knowing the outcome of the story. If you were to take a whole array of stories and compare them in terms of what is their structure, the structure is actually remarkably similar each time. If we break down the mechanics of how you know different shows are constructed or different superhero movies or something like that, switch out superhero movies and all you're changing is the costume or the features of what makes that hero a hero. But they're all they're all uh, subject to sort of the same sort of structural analysis because they have remarkably similar structures. If the quality of a movie, for example, consists in your not knowing what's going to happen and your enjoyment of it is predicated on it not being spoiled then i think there is something lacking in it and to me that's the best that's the that's the first thing that comes to my mind when we think about the addiction to novelty as a characteristic of modern art making it, if, if something can truly be spoiled by a spoiler then it probably isn't something that's really worth your time in the first place because the experience of it like Beethoven's Ninth or whatever, pick your pick pick some sort of universally agreeable. I shouldn't even say that that's universally agreeable, but pick some extremely popular uh, piece of artwork that a lot of people can agree on as something worthy and, and of substance. It doesn't matter if you know what the end sounds like because you want to listen to it again, or you want to watch it again, or you want to feel it again and go through it again. And I think, in a way, this addiction to novelty is exemplified by that. Now, if we go over to music, though. I would I would argue that hip hop is one of the healthier areas of uh, music making, and I'm obviously really biased to it because I love it so much and I'm so into it. But hip hop has always been, and you know, particularly for the Black American experience, uh, yeah, as as I speak for, as an outsider from that, um, but as a student of of this form, a mode of discourse first and foremost. It's a place where ideas are exchanged, where through the, the code and the texture and the idiom of uh, the form, there's a conversation constantly happening between speaker and audience and between different speakers, whether in the form of you know, debate and battle or just you know, the, 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 the interchange of ideas that happens with such a verbal art form. And I think that's still happening now I would say that in the mainstream of hip hop and the stuff that you hear, if you're just like turning on Hot 97 here in New York, you're mostly hearing party songs. And that was true 10 years ago. And that was true 20 years ago and 30 years ago and 40 years ago. There's always been predominantly things that are operating at not as pronounced of an intellectual level in the mainstream sources of our information intake in hip hop as in elsewhere. But always at every point in the history of the form, there's been, there's been practitioners who are using it for really elevated forms of discourse, really incisive forms of discourse, critiquing various cultural institutions, critiquing the police, critiquing uh, the US government, critiquing institutional racism. I mean, critical race theory before that was a term that anybody said uh, you know, in common parlance is something that's been going on in hip hop in terms of crit critiquing institutions and showing how racism is still a salient feature of them. 
since since Public Enemy, since even before that, you know, then that's that's the late '80s and early '90s. Um, and Chuck D from Public Enemy called hip hop the black CNN. That was the way that he framed, you know, what it is, particularly to white viewers of CNN who wouldn't know what to do with it and were like, what is this noise or whatever, you know? And I'm not trying to speak on that with authority either, because again, that's not my experience, but it is what first got me into it as a student and what got me into it as a creator, because that's how it resonated with me as a form of very trenchant discourse. And I do still think that that's happening. That's it, to try to connect all the dots here. Um, I do think that the conversation is so exploded now. There's so many, there's so many conversations that are happening because of where, because of the sites of transmission, because of the internet, basically, to put it in a nutshell, uh, that the, the arms race of novelty in the mainstream, in terms of being the most heard, if you really want to explode as an artist, as a filmmaker or as a, you know a pop star or hip hop star, then you are playing that novelty game at an ever increasing rate because of the need to compete with such uh, an exponentially increasing flux of background noise because there's so much of it going on. And so the same conditions that have facilitated our ability to connect and create content, you know, on in our niches, we're adding to an ever growing sort of uh, competitiveness, I think, that fuels that that um, novelization, we'll call it maybe of of of, of art. What, what what you said about novel not novelty, and especially with uh, antiquity, that's actually really interesting and not something uh, th that I knew about that's, that's kind of like the, the art that they would be exposed to, for example, in a, in a theater, that actually something that they, they have been, that they mostly, uh, knew the outcome, uh, that, that, that's actually very interesting. Um, although I'm, I'm a bit torn when you mentioned the, the two examples of, for example, a, a Beethoven symphony, which is kind of like, um, it's, it's not exhaustible by the novels. In fact, my, my vast experience with classical music is, is it's exactly the opposite. It's like the more you listen to it, the more you understand and the more you enjoy no, it. That's precisely what I mean. That's precisely yeah, yeah. what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, but, but I'm, and, but with a more narrative um, art form, I, I have a, at least I don't identify with it as much. So, for example, when I think about really, really great stories, uh, like like my favorite stories that I've ever read or known, like a feeling that I always get, and I think it's quite a common feeling, is that I wish I could forget it, so I could experience it like mm. the first time again. And that's kind of the appeal of like showing it to someone, right? Like you show it to a girlfriend, it's like you'll be mind blown by this. Like it's 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 amazing. So uh, with music, like that point is is really salient, and and I would, I would definitely uh, agree with that. Although with narrative. At, at least from my experience, that seems harder to apply. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I brought it up as an illustrative example. I think certainly there's there's an element of surprise that works in the favor of and enriches the experience of reading a narrative because there's an element of surprise in the narrative of our lives. I mean, it is fun to find out what's going to happen next. And it, it, there's, an, you know, not knowing the future is certainly one of the important structuring conditions of our human experience. You know, <laughs> it'd be a lot different if we already knew the story. But I think the stories that enrich us the most, or I should just speak for myself, when a story truly enriches me, the most important thing turns out not to have been the surprise factor, but the contemplation of the whole and the way that that maps onto my own life and in a way does allow me to look into the future because we're all conditioned by, for better and for worse, the narratives that we're familiar with, the myths that we're familiar with in, in the deepest and fullest sense of that world, word, and they do reveal to us where we're going. We might not be able to articulate exactly how it's going to play out, but we know in a deep sense where we're going. We, we know that we're going to some sort of beyond that we don't, you know, can't articulate or some sort of, you know, finale that we, we can't articulate. We know uh, that we're following an arc, you know, in, in the, and I guess in that sense, I'm trying to evoke, you know, uh, 
like Jungian type of thinking and, and you know, Joseph Campbell type of thinking that we're, we're, we do follow arcs. We follow mythic and narrative arcs in our lives. And um, so in that sense, yeah, the novelty is part of the richness and joy of narrative, but I don't think it's the main point. And I, and, and I, but I, I think you bring up something really important though. And I, cause I, you know, it's, it's true in music, it's true in art in general, and just there's a competitiveness that's going on now more and more because of the amount of in, in, information and the need to compete for one another's attention. And that begins, it's, its roots, I think, are in the commodification of things. Because again, if I, got, if I have to sell you my art, I need to make it as novel as possible just to get your attention in the first place. And that's not necessarily always helpful. And so also just to as a, as a quick uh, reply to, to, the, to the part about uh, hip hop, first of all, it, it's a bit obviously hard uh, to reply out of my incredible ignorance just, just about the whole um, uh, field in general. Uh, but I, I, I do agree with uh, what you said and, and it does make sense. And, and there's, also, there's also the problem of how exactly of the hip hop that I have in my mind and the hip hop that you value in your mind that obviously it's, it's very hard to see how much exactly um, those those overlap? Because obviously, what's the most popular, especially for an outsider, uh, generally doesn't coincide with what is valued inside uh, the community as well. So that that's that's definitely something that you know probably makes a big difference in how we view it, and that's something that I should have taken into account. It, yeah, it's there's. I'll I'll send you like a playlist of stuff that I feel like illustrates this idea. I mean the, um, the, I don't know what are good examples. That Kendrick Lamar, you know, you know Kendrick Lamar. You familiar yeah. with? Yeah. So I mean, he was given a Pulitzer not long ago for for Damn for this album from last year, maybe the, no, the year before that, and you know there was maybe some surprise at that. But I think it was an effort to recognize the form as a journalistic form or as one that's engaging with social discourse in a way that is extremely essential and extremely influential and extremely incisive and uh, and intelligent. And th uh, there are other examples. I, that, I, that's an example of something that even in the mainstream, even at the, at the very pinnacle of uh, the share of attention um, – being recognized for and, and being utilized for uh, that kind of really sincere and substantive dialogue, you know? Got it. Um, so <laughs> maybe something that I should have brought up uh, earlier uh, is that we've talked a lot of, um, uh, even when talking about uh, music, oddly enough, but we've brought up, you know, uh, Plato and antiquity in general several times. Uh, and maybe it's just worth mentioning that Nathan has a PhD in classics. Maybe that that was an important detail that I should have <laughs> <laughs> said from from the very beginning. Otherwise, people might be a bit confused. Oh, this rapper just comes here and talks about ancient Greece. Like what the hell? So first of all, I, I'm a bit uh, I'm a bit ignorant about classics in general. I'm I'm actually a bit confused on what exactly uh, does it entail. Like where is the cutoff? for the periods of, of in terms of history and also what is typically covered on it because I'm, I'm guessing it kind of refers to that historical period and, and the culture but then that is so huge like it includes philosophy it includes language includes art so, so what exactly is the field yeah it's a very it's 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 not a not a simple answer really because the question you're asking is a good question there's there's debate even sometimes about whether this should exist as a discipline and how it really is meant to be defined, although the irony there is that it's so much older than all, than really all the other disciplines in the humanities. It originally was the humanities. So they used to call classics, at least in, in the English idiom, they called it philology. You know the word philology? Or, um, yeah. And now, you know, philology just literally means like the, the love of the logos, you know, in the same way that philosophy is the love of wisdom. And so it's the study of language, but it meant that you were expert in the languages. And it used to be that in Western civilization, when we really say the languages, we mean Latin and Greek. I mean, those were the ones, those are the ones that anything of any seriousness is written in. And so it's the use of the word classics is similar to the use of the word in the context of classical music, let's say. Etymologically just means belonging to a class, 
but there's an implicit valuation that's going on that means it belongs to the best class. And so when in the Renaissance, for instance, when uh, you know you had the Italian humanists especially and the other humanists in Europe who were really getting into the practice of scholarship, they were about recovering what they thought was the best literature that existed in the ages previous. And then the word classics doesn't really come into use until like a couple of hundred years after is, that. Is it, but isn't that implied kind of the etymology of it as well? Isn't classic something like a like a division that I think yeah, kind that's, of like that's, a class that's, division? That's precisely what I mean. Yeah, exactly. So oh, okay, okay, sorry, it, misunderstood. You know, uh, the study of classics is not the same as classicism, where you believe that people belong to different classics, classes. Uh, or a different hierarchy of rankings, but there is a hierarchical note embedded in the word because it refers, you know, originally to that, um, or it embeds that idea that this is of the highest order or the most original order and therefore of the highest order since it begins the whole conversation. And obviously not everybody's classics are the same, but that's also reflected in how the word is used. I mean, we can say classic hip 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 hop and people will know what you mean by classic hip hop. They'll think of the golden era sort of hip hop, they'll think of the early 90s and stuff like that and certain artists that you can't supersede, you know. They'll think of Biggie and Tupac because you can't go beyond uh, the founders in the sense of them opening up the entire conversation. So I think in that sense, it's still applied as far as Western civilization goes to the, the Greeks and the Romans, and it studies Greco-Roman civilization for that reason. However, even the concept of Western civilization is largely on the chopping block because there's a lot of folks in the humanities who increasingly feel like that category doesn't really make sense. It doesn't really reflect an actuality, it just reflects a group of ideologies that we keep on repeating and keep on feeding to people as though it's inherently of importance or inherently of value. And that does deserve question because when you actually start to look at the history, it's you know messy everywhere. It's always somebody conquering somebody else and then bringing some ideas that they got from somebody who conquered them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, on down the line. And so the idea of vastly restructuring it is relevant. But I, so yeah, just to define the discipline in a more distinct way, pretty much it studies stuff that was going on in the Mediterranean world from like usually like the 8th century BCE or so when literature gets started up through the 5th century CE or so when the Roman Empire, you know, gradually fades and collapses or turns into something different and Christianity arises. So it's the, you know, the pagan era of the Mediterranean world. It does go farther back than the 8th century BCE into the civilizations that preceded Greek civilization as we know it, but it mainly starts, or at least conventionally, usually you're studying texts and stuff that are written from about that time forward. Got it, got it. Greek and in Latin. Uh, what you mentioned about how history gets uh, messy once you look into it and the, all these categories um, start to get blurry. Something that I, that I found funny is that how we look kind of like at the center of Western civilization uh, uh, from the Greeks, uh, which is obviously true in some sense but also like it's, it's not like the greeks invented of what we generally consider greek culture like it was just the culture before them and it was just the cultural including philosophy mm -hmm. of everyone around them and, and especially yeah. because <laughs> yeah. and and we tend to consider greece as like the epicenter of um kind of western civilization which we associate uh, with europe for obvious reasons but also an important point is that greece is actually quite far Uh, quite far east as, as if you look at Europe as a whole yep. and so it actually has quite a, an easy connection to the east and obviously they're all talking and trading with each other absolutely yeah no it's it's they they were they were all about including and embracing and then reconfiguring things that came from all over and we're extremely it's so ironic because there is in the culture war that's happening right now about how do we define uh, 21st century civilization and Is there such a thing as Western civilization? Is there a Western tradition? And to whom does it belong? And the casual association among a lot of proponents of the Western tradition and a lot of critics of it would be that, you know, the Greeks were, you know, these white folks who stole some stuff from other people and then said, like, look what we invented. But it really wasn't like that as far as the actual literature that you can read, because all of those early philosophers and those early poets were quite open and quite fascinated by Uh, the debt that they owed to the civilizations that surrounded them. They were aware of that transmission. They were um, preoccupied by Egypt. They were preoccupied by the other 
civilizations that they had taken from and had a sense of them their 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 own selves not being the originators of anything but being you know interpreters from their own perspective and so it's ironic that they get critiqued for being sort of uh the false poster child of something you know or being you know the original appropriators because i feel like (laughs) that's that's one of the critiques that they get but i would argue that that you can find a lot of evidence of them being really um I'm generalizing, but being quite interested in you know where they got their info. But it is certainly true that the myth that has often been promulgated in, in textbooks that, yeah, the Greeks invented science, <laughs> you know, the Greeks invented philosophy, the Greeks invented rational thought. And before that, human beings were wallowing in the darkness and they would continue to do so until the light of Greek intellect spread to them is very much um, a myth in the shallow sense. And not, not only is it funny because of that obviously they didn't invent those things per se, but also from a historical perspective as well, because like there's certain ideas in philosophy that uh, if, you, if you open like a standard, uh, you know, introductory philosophy book that it says, you know, some, some like, you know, Descartes started, you know, skepticism or some, or some bullshit <laughs> like that. And then there's like some East, some dude in Asia that have, that have said the exact same thing, <laughs> yeah, yeah, like totally. a thousand years before it. <laughs> yeah. I, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot at stake when we use words, obviously, and philosophy is certainly one of these words, because there's different ways to use it. You can use it in the broad sense and in the specific sense, and it's important to define which way you're using it. I often find myself debating which one I mean when I end up spilling forth the word, because sometimes it makes sense to really restrict it and be like, when I say philosophy, I do mean a specific tradition that does have its origin in the Greek milieu in the late archaic period and in Asia Minor, you know, in what's now Turkey and then in the, in the Greek mainland as well. And then moving forward through mainly a European tradition and then now practiced in Europe and United States and all over the world, but mainly in those places. That's the specific version of what philosophy is. Very specific conversation. Just like, you know, when we say uh, hip hop, we could mean something specific or general, you know what I mean? So we could just talk about, oh, the art of having beats and rapping, or we could say something more specific about, no, certain human beings from certain places starting, you know, in the United States and then spreading out throughout the rest of the world. Um, And it's important to distinguish the two because we can say world philosophy, but then we mean something much broader and philosophy as such as a word applied to, you know, let's say, Taoism or something like that from the Chinese tradition, it's a much different thing the, the you know, in, in different civilizations, the separation between, you know, philosophy and religion or philosophy and theology is, is, has a different kind of relationship than it has in the, the capital P specific um, uh, philosophy tradition. So those distinctions are important. But I think at this point, there's more to be gained by making comparisons and analogies than there is by segmenting at least when we're having a discussion like this or whenever whenever a popular audience is is whenever we're talking to everybody you know try and find the analogies and the similarities yeah that's very true um i'm curious about what your background was uh before your phd like what did you study as an undergrad and has your master's and also what drew you into the field like what why did you went in that particular direction um, that's a good question. It was very sort of haphazard. I was always mainly focused on the music, and that was true when I was getting my undergraduate degree. At, I'm from Washington State, so like up, uh, I was, I went to Western Washington University. It's up in Bellingham, Washington, almost in Canada, but on the in the northwest of the United States. And uh, I was going to school and I was mainly working on my tunes and wanting to make songs and stuff. And I wanted to graduate as quickly as possible. And I found out that you could do uh, like a build your own major because there was no Latin major there, but I really liked studying Latin just just because. And uh, so I did the Latin major just because it was the quickest way because I was able to do independent studies where I didn't have to go to class uh, except once a week, just meeting with my professor. So it just seemed very efficient. It was very flowy. And I was like, I'll do that. And then I wanted to go to New York. And I feel like I kind of needed an excuse to go to New York um, besides because I wanted to go to New York to pursue music. That was like my dream. And I wanted to pursue a relationship that no longer exists. (laughs) And I needed a real tangible pretext for this. So I was like, oh, I'll go to grad school. Like that was literally the reason I did it. (laughs) That was as far as my thinking went 
And so I, I pursued a master's in classics because my degree was in Latin, not because I even had that strong of an interest in the ancient world, honestly, at the time. I, <laughs> when, I, when I showed up, everyone was so much more knowledgeable than me and so much more passionate. And I was like, what am I doing here? Even my advisor from my undergraduate was like, are you sure you want to do this? Like, because <laughs> she knew that it wasn't even my main squeeze, you know, but I'm glad that I did it. It kind of feels like, you know, the scene in, uh, it's probably not the reference you were expecting here, but the scene in Harry Potter where they put the hat on, uh, have you ever read Harry Potter before? There's I like haven't read it, but hat. I know what you're referring to. Yeah, the naming hat that puts you in like one of the different houses, um, and the hat is like, oh, I'm going to put you in Slytherin or whatever. And Harry's like, oh, no, shit. Like, I want to be in Gryffindor. Like, I'm not a Slytherin type of dude. And then he, like, asked the hat to change it or whatever. I don't remember exactly how the scene goes. But that's kind of how I feel about classics. Like, I was maybe supposed I was probably should have been, like, in English or something, you know. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if classics is Gryffindor or Slytherin in the analogy. But it took a long time for me to, like, really feel comfortable because I was, like, it was the languages that got me into it. I love studying languages. And it took me a long time to reconcile with the fact that I devoted so much of my life to studying Greeks and Romans, you know. <laughs> wow. Interesting. Uh, we're very different people. Like, I, even though I don't know a lot, just because I've been focusing on other subjects, uh, I do like learning about history and the ancient world, but I absolutely hate languages. Holy no crap. kidding. Really? <laughs> They're just hard. Like, I know English just because... I was such a nerd when I was young and everything was in English and I just, absorbed I just it. practiced. Yeah. I just absorbed it by just a, mi a million hours of it. But for example, now I live in Slovenia uh, and trying to learn Slovenian is just so hard. Like mm. it's just unbelievable. Um, but yeah, you do you feel like languages go, at least you, you can make a, a, a really cool Latin rap video. I, and there, there isn't many of those. There, there, there are very few of them. Um, I mean, I would say, too, it's a different thing because, you know, I, I am not fluent in any modern language besides English. I used to be pretty good at Italian and I could get around and now I'm learning Spanish and I can get around, but I'm not fluent in either of them. And studying Latin and Greek is a much different enterprise. It's maybe you would like it because it's you don't have to speak it with anybody. You know, you, it's, it's, in, it's analytical. You're, you're just it's like you're um, it's like you're cracking a code or something when you're first learning it. And it just, it, so I'm really into grammar and stuff like that. It's, it's philosophically interesting to me. So I, that, that's, that's why I like Latin and Greek. Got it. So when you know, you just winced lot, at the word grammar. You just, <laughs> I did. I did. A very, like I tried to make the, the, the biggest one. I, I yeah, that muster. was quite, uh, quite demonstrative. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when you know a lot about a field, um, like you noticed, you notice immediately how, there's just these common patterns about how that field is perceived in the general population. Um, what are examples of that occurring uh, to you? So what are like common misperceptions about antiquity and classics? Oh, that's a good, um, that's a good question. Um, um, but yeah, I mean, I think that this touches on some of the stuff that you asked about just now, the, that we were discussing just now, I think there's a perception, it depends on who we're talking about, but in, in progressive thought, in critical thought uh, on the left in academia, I think there's a suspicion of classics in a way sometimes, sometimes of being uh, sort of the, you know, like the good old boys club or something like that since it's, since it, since it has uh, since it goes so far back in the tradition and there's suspicion of like in the same way that there's suspicion of the con concept of Western civilization and whether that's cogent or helpful or not. But within classics, there's a lot of folks who are trying to improve that to make it more inclusive. There's a lot of folks who are um, critiquing the traditions of uh, the racist traditions in classics and the racist tendencies in classics and things that to make classics less about, you know, whiteness and, and to sort of clean house, which, which means both getting at the truth in terms of the stuff we're talking about, about how the Greeks owe so much um, to other civilizations and to change that narrative and to actually change how the discipline is structured and who's working and who's, who's, who's getting the jobs and, and who's writing and getting published and make that less homogenous. Um, I'm not really sure if this answers your question, but I guess there's a lot of, you know, I, I think there's an outside perception of it being maybe like stuffy or something 
or or being you know you think of classics and you think of you know the marble uh bust um but it's important to remember that those busts were actually painted originally you know and therein is the distinction the the the, the actual substance of it is colorful and weird and strange and very vibrant and full of life and i think the outside association is that it's the most staid and sedate and sort of somber <laughs> of the humanities disciplines <laughs> the the busts um is, is is such a great example because it's, it's just so funny because it's it's such a such a good analogy it's 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 almost like the the richness of a culture kind of fading over time and then when we look back on it we look back on it has you know just 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 white with without without you know it's it's fullness like I, th i think it has a really good parallel with the with the middle ages as well like we tend to think of the middle ages as like this really dark mm -hmm. period of like where it's, it's there's barely any sun or something like that right and and then and then there's just like cathedrals that are just like you enter it and it's like you have a religious experience yeah. the, the first step you walk in yeah i think that's that's a wonderful Yeah, that's a, that's another great analogy. Yeah, we abstract things and we yeah we take all the life out of them, and then and then also we end up we tend to cultivate whatever is represented to us in popular context. You know what I mean? Like yeah, the the, the Middle Ages of the movies does look sort of dark and dreary. And whenever I encounter any information about the Middle Ages, I always feel just lost. I mean, the other day I was reading a like a undergraduate level Western Civ textbook just to sort of get better acquainted with what happens from the 5th century CE forward. Because I was realizing, I was like, wow, my knowledge of antiquity is like not not even as robust as most classicists, but it's you know more robust maybe than the average person just who never studied classics at least. And uh, I was like, but I really don't know what happens after that. You know, I, I can't really tell you in any sort of detail. It's all super vague to me, and I was trying to follow it. You know, It's really hard to follow. I got, the, the scholars of the Middle Ages, they've got way more details to keep track of because there's way more information to operate from. That's one of the problems. And there's way more literature. And so it's just wildly complex as a discipline. There's a lot going on. Imagine what people are going to be dealing with if, if, if even, you know, say like a fifth of the total information right now is preserved in terms of literary information, cultural information, artistic information, musical information, even if you're a, if you're just a student of the humanities, how would you possibly organize, you know, what the different departments are? It's just so, it's too much of a sprawl. And what would be of interest, you know, is, you know, is every podcast going to be of interest, you know, or are people's lives, the amount of information we have on people's lives. I'm going on a huge tangent right now. But th there was this French author, I forget what his name is, He has like a popular introduction to Cicero. I remember reading it one time. Shoot, forget what it's called, but he made the remark that we may may know we we, we know more about Cicero than we know about anybody else uh, who who lived before or after up until the 19th or 20th century. I forget how he frames the claim, but something like this. I'm 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 paraphrasing it. We know more about the life of Cicero than about any other human being living before him or after him up until the 19th or 20th century, simply because we have all of Cicero's letters and a great deal of his published works. And we also know from other people who are involved in that cultural moment and of all the intrigue that was going on with Caesar and, you know, the Roman civil war and stuff like that. Sometimes we can reconstruct what Cicero's days were for like a week. Like we know what he was doing. We know what he was up to, which is a huge amount of information to have about somebody who lived, you know, millennia ago it's kind of insane and it's of interest to us because cicero is super famous and it becomes this feedback loop where because we have the information it's of deeper and deeper interest because we can comment on it and people can comment on those comments etc 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 well now we have a lot of information about every single human being especially every single human being who is involved in you know social media and particularly the ones who are involved in promoting themselves thereon. you know what i mean so if you wanted to do an artistic biography of you or me and what we're doing with our lives, you would have so much to work with that it would not be a job of inclusion, but a job of exclusion. What do I get rid of? And so sometimes my mind reels 
when I consider the amount of data that will be available to the historian, so much so that it would seem to me that you'd start to question whether or not the uh, quantitative aspects of history are even valid. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because your job is actually what not to talk about, you know, because there's so much going on. <laughs> this is not particularly uh, in, in a historical sense like you're describing, but, but just has a parallel. Uh, this, this like overwhelming information, even already ignoring the, the problem of, of relevance, funny enough, um, like even taking into account that everything is relevant, we're already encountering this problem of of the overabundance of information in the scientific field. Because, you know, if you're a doctor, you need to keep up with, a, with the advanced, latest advances in medicine, except that it's literally impossible mm -hmm. because the rate of papers being published, yeah. no doctor can read it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then when you compound that in terms of history and, and it's not, not in terms of science, but in terms of people's lives and stuff like that, then it just, it just explodes. It's insane. No, it's it's a really it's an important thing. I mean, I uh, uh, something I've been thinking about recently is the concept of minimalism as applied not just to physical space and physical objects, but digital spaces and informational spaces. I mean, uh, digital minimalism. I forget the name of the person who coined that term, but there it is a term that I've heard floating around. Boy, a much different thing doing podcasts when you can just like type stuff in. Uh, do you often find yourself doing this when you're doing these podcasts? Like you look stuff up as you go? Uh, no, not really. Although it is nice to, Cal <laughs> to just Newport have it is, available. Is the, yeah, Cal Newport. Oh, right, right. It's, it's, exactly. It's, yeah, and I, I haven't read it. But I think it's, it's an important conversation because in the same way we have to curate our spaces, and, and you know, modernism is like a mode of home decor is you know, all about you know, stripping it down. Uh, or to put it another term, you know, you're familiar with Marie Kondo. You know Marie Kondo. She was really popular so. recently. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know the, the thing of like you pick up an object in your space and it's, does this spark joy? And if it sparks joy, you keep it. And if it doesn't, then get rid of it. I feel like collectively and as individuals, we need to do that about the information that we encounter. Like I think each of our Instagrams, we should be following like probably like fifty folks. How many more things than that can you possibly be appreciating on a regular basis? You know, <laughs> Does you, can your sphere of care really extend beyond that? And why would you bombard yourself with, you know, more than that? You know, <laughs> anyway, different topic. That's very true. So um, I want to get into your dissertation, uh, oh, cool. which, which, by the way, was was a a decent amount of work to go through Wait, not because did, it's did bad you read the whole thing not the whole thing but i tried to read the most interesting bits uh to me like maybe a third of it or something like that wow you're uh, good, good job <laughs> <laughs> but it was very well written but some parts uh, um, were quite difficult uh in, in a good way and so i want to cover some of it so a good place to start is maybe Give a very very brief, just just in case someone isn't familiar, uh, so, because otherwise nothing is going to make sense. A brief introduction uh, to Plato, um, which you're in a pretty good position to do. Uh, and also, more more personally, I'm curious about how does his uh, book that you mostly reference uh, throughout your dissertation, which I'm not going to try to pronounce it because I'm going to mess it up. How does it that stand out against the overall? body of work of Plato and more specific the Republic because it's not something that I've seen reference very much in ah. my okay, yeah, philosophical great. ignorance. Cool, cool questions. God, I st I'm still I'm I'm just so shocked that you undertook the dissertation. I wish you'd ask me because when whenever anybody else has asked if they can read it, I always say read chapter one and chapter five and then skip all the middle ones. Because the middle ones, to be honest, sometimes like as I was writing them, I was like, "This is boring to me." <laughs> but the first, well, bit, I, like, I, I do, I do think that most of the ones that I skipped are, are the middle ones. Yeah, yeah. But like, I, but I've been insanely busy this week, so I actually didn't plan to read much of your dissertation. I just wanted to kind of see what the overall layout was and some of the points you made. Uh, but it was interesting. Like I, I've always, especially because I've always loved Whitehead. But at the same time, without actually knowing close to anything about Whitehead. Wow! I, wow! I'm so excited to get into Whitehead. Okay, this is so cool. Um, uh, okay, so Plato, Plato, philosopher, Greek. 
philosopher, 5th to 4th centuries BCE, time period wise, student of Socrates, teacher of Aristotle. Those are the bare generalities. And most people are relatively familiar with Plato, mostly because, I wouldn't, shouldn't say most people, but a lot of people are. And those who are, are familiar probably because at some point in their lives, they were made to read The Republic. And The Republic is this book where there's a dialogue between Socrates and a number of other characters about what is the nature of justice and the nature of the good and how do we figure out those big picture questions. Maybe a way we could do that is we make a, a conversation about what a good city would be like or what a just city would be like, and that'll allow us to map that onto an individual person on the assumption that microcosmically to macrocosmically, uh, an individual person is somehow structured like a good city or a good community or a person is the community. Anyway, it's a crazy book because there's crazy stuff going on in this ideal city that they make up. Like you, they censor all the art. They give people jobs whether they want them or not. Um, it's extremely oppressive by any standards of you know a modern democratic um, free society type of mindset. And so most people end up thinking of Plato as this sort of bizarre uh, kook who wants to control everybody's lives and wants to do so on the basis of an almost fanatical worship of – uh, what are called the forms. And so most people who know a little bit more about Plato associate him with his famous doctrine of forms or platonic forms, so-called. Platonic forms are a little bit difficult to define because Plato talks about them in different ways in different works. But it's basically this, the notion that reality has, uh, um, let's say for the moment, two different aspects. There's a flowiness to reality. Things change and constantly alter, you know, bodies grow and decay, and nothing ever stays the same. Nevertheless, there are certain aspects of reality that are always the same. The number two is always the number two. Mathematics always works, irrespective of its iteration in a given context. And the concept of two-ness, the concept of duality, the property of there being two, two human beings, or two fingers out of the five on your hand, or um, two rocks you know, sitting by one another, that is always true. And so are the other uh, ultimate forms or ultimate elements that we find in the universe, like extension or height or depth. Those are physical properties or justice or goodness. Uh, those are um, more psychological properties or more uh, ethical properties, rather. These things for Plato exist as ultimate forms irrespective of their iteration in a given moment in reality, and they are themselves divine. And so there's an implicit notion in Plato that there's something uh, divine or, or derived from God about these forms. Uh, and so when we learn Plato, usually what we learn is that Plato had this love for these perfect forms, and in contrast to them, disliked the changeful nature of everyday reality and felt that everyday reality was actually filled with illusion and that it was only the philosopher who had the capacity to recognize the ultimate forms of what truly exists and to see through the confusing illusions that most of us muddle through as everyday human beings. And so you put this all together, having read The Republic, and you have this guy who thinks that most people are idiots because most of them are wandering around in confusion. They need to be controlled by philosopher kings who have the unique capacity to see the abstract, eternal, divine forms that course through the universe and to make calls about how we should structure society on the basis of that vision, which is a pretty crazy lump of claims. I mean, at least, again, from the perspective of somebody who values individual freedom or from the perspective of somebody who thinks that the here and now is actually very rich and wonderful and is not just some illusion that we should dismiss. There's a lot of things that you can critique about that. But it's ironic that we read the Republic, because this is to the next part of your question, the Timaeus, a different dialogue of Plato, was actually the much more popular work in the immediate legacy of Plato, especially up through the Middle Ages. It wasn't until the early modern period that the Republic became the thing that people usually read in schools. The Timaeus is a much different book, and it's about the creation of the universe. And the universe, as ex explicated in the Timaeus, is an organism, a sentient organism that is made up of a bunch of different parts, but is itself a giant animal 
that loves itself and exists the way an animal exists. It has sentience and all of this. Um, and I guess, yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the general introduction. And then my dissertation happens to be about uh, this philosopher, Alfred North Whitehead, and how in his view, the Plato of the Republic um, was not done reasoning through everything. And so the things that he has to say that sound sort of like they denigrate the material world in favor of this divine world, the world beyond, are in fact uh, not Plato's full opinion, not Plato's full view. And that, that full view is actually embedded in the Timaeus because in the Timaeus, where we have the universe as a sentient organism, it's not so much a thing of like the world is an illusion and the heaven beyond where the perfect mathematical forms are is good. Rather, the forms are in the world and the world is choosing its own forms like an organism choosing its different moves that it wants to make. And so there's a real holism that is um, missed in Plato as a result of us reading the Republic instead of the Timaeus. That's the very summary version of, you know, what that, what my project was about. That was perfect. I actually didn't know that was the main uh, work uh, in his time. That's actually, it's, it's, my, my own ignorance is actually mind blowing me how, how I never heard of that. It's before. a crazy transmission story. So, I mean, like, you know, philosophy kind of, this is a little bit of a tangent, but the torch of philosophy essentially gets passed to the Islamic world. Um, after it's after the Greco after, after Greco Roman civilization kind of um, dissipates or, or or fades into European civilization, and in the Islamic tradition, they didn't really distinguish between Plato and Aristotle because they were the way they received the texts were in very fragmentary form and they were often confusing who is who. So they sort of took them together as being one thing, and they were mostly drawing on ideas that came from. Aristotle's metaphysics, and if we're talking about cosmology, Aristotle's metaphysics and Plato's Timaeus in a sort of mashup. And so they were getting elements of Plato, elements of Aristotle, and elements of Plotinus, who's a very mystical Platonic philosopher. Um, and they sort of, you know, construed them all as this one thing. And it's really that legacy that, that went forward into the Middle Ages. Got it. Um... So I want to get into Whitehead, but but before we get into that, something that I've always um, struggled uh, a bit, and even though this is not concerning Whitehead, it will be relevant later, is how ex how exactly are the differences and how do they relate uh, between how Plato approached mathematic mathematics and Pythagoras approached mathematics? Because obviously Plato has a very has a natural affinity to mathematical realism mm -hmm. and also Pythagoras has kind of like a mystical element of mathematics, but I'm, I'm not exactly sure uh, what the differences are. Yeah. I don't know if you could even, I, I don't know if I certainly wish limit it to myself, but I don't know if I can say if there are differences because what there mostly are in evidence are similarities. I mean, we know that Plato was deeply influenced by Pythagoras and the Timaeus in particular is a through and through Pythagorean, uh, work. Timaeus himself is presented as being a, it was the main speaker of the dialogue. So the dialogue uh, does not have Socrates as one of the, as the main speaker. He's one of the characters, but he's mostly silently listening the entire time. And it's Timaeus, who's this Pythagorean thinker, who's speaking. And he's essentially giving a Pythagorean account of the origin of the universe, where number is one of the primeval elements or the, the primary sort of elements. And, and it's, it's very, very much in the um, in the Pythagorean tradition. So as far as I understand, and how I think of him anyway, Plato is building on Pythagoras. He has the mystical sort of attitude toward forms, you know, as we call them. Um, and he has the sort of commitment to the primacy of mathematics that, you know, that Pythagoras had. But, uh, so getting into, uh, Whiteheads. Uh, first of all, I'm I'm curious about uh, b before we get into the metaphysics. Um, he first started as a mathematician, mathematician, and I'm curious about how he viewed mathematics in relationship to uh, Platonism, and especially because how, how uh, Whitehead I think viewed mathematics in relation to Platonism. 
Yeah, yeah. especially because I, I think I've read that uh, he viewed mathematics as an abstraction, that that it's not, you know, it, it's it's not actually real in itself beyond its instrumentality of describing patterns in the world. But it's not a, a real pattern per se. It's not a form, an idols per se. Mm-hmm. Um, but that strikes me as deeply anti-Platonic. So how, how does that work? Yeah, that's a good, that's a really good question. And it's, it's a difficult question to answer because like Plato himself, Whitehead admits of some variation in attitude and emphasis. Um, but I, one of the core concepts for Whitehead, and one of the best ways maybe to introduce what he's talking about, is his concept of the, the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. Have you heard that term before? Um, yeah, but you'll have to explain <clears throat> that. It's sort of exactly what you're talking about. It just means don't mistake abstractions for actualities. The world is process. Constant change, alteration, and evolution. And in it, we can analyze certain forms, but don't mistake them for being concrete. Um, For instance, the form of uh, the human being. You know, we think of a human being as this essential category. There's something that defines human being, and there's a sort of uh, fixity to it. But really, we're a process of a bunch of material things that are going on. We're, we're a process of cells, and those cells are a process of molecules, and those molecules a process of atoms, and those atoms a process of subatomic parts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's all seething and flowing and moving. For the sake of discussion on our scale of reality with the psychological apparatus that we have, it makes a lot of sense to think of a human being as a static thing, at least for the sake of discussion. In the same way that it makes sense uh, for us to say a mountain is a very static thing, you know, because look, it's a mountain. It's there like the whole time that the average human being is alive unless it happens to erupt, you know, in their lifetime. But it too is just a process. I mean, imagine taking like a video of that uh, mountain for millennia and then playing it fast. It would just look like a lump of sand on a beach that, you know, gathers and then dissipates again just because of, you know, the wind and stuff blowing it around. It too is a process. The fallacy of misplaced concreteness is to impose on reality uh, the characteristics of essential static forms or essential static uh, features that it doesn't actually have. And really what it's pushing against the most is essentialism in the Aristotelian sense. So Aristotle, who was, like I said, the student of Plato, departed from Plato very radically in certain important respects that we can get into shortly maybe. But one of, the main, one of his main legacies is the concept of essences, that the different species, the different types of thing that exist in the universe have, have finite and unchanging essences. A human being just is a human being. There's a way to define what a human being is. It's a rational animal, and you can't change that definition, and it just is what it is. Essentialism is something that still shows up in our thinking, largely in some ways as a legacy of this kind of Aristotelian thinking, where we go, something is what something is, and it has been from time eternal, and it will be into the future indefinitely because that's just how it is. Gender essentialism, for instance, is, is, is an example of this, where there's something that defines what the masculine is and something that defines what the feminine is, and it has its basis in reality. And that would be maybe one of the ultimate examples or essentialism is the, is the uh, antagonist uh, that in a way Whitehead sets himself up against in this critique um, uh, that he calls the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. That is not a concrete thing, actually. There are no concrete things. There are processes. There is flux, and flux is the primary category, flow and change and alteration. Um, however, in that change and alteration, we do have certain forms that repeat themselves. I mean, it's obvious that, that there is this going on. You know what I mean? It would be foolish to say that it's all just flux and flow. And you could dismiss all of the forms we have as being, you know, illusion in some way or being meaningless and like, you know, whatever. We're just seeing pattern where there is none. There is actually pattern of a certain kind. And these patterns he calls, uh, at least in certain places in his thought, eternal objects. And eternal objects are, at least in some way, apparently, 
similar to platonic forms in that they're repeatable structures that we see emerge in the process of, of reality is unfolding. And they do exist eternally because they have to exist eternally for them to be repeated in the first place. If they you know, emerge and then completely dissipate and will never exist again, then we can't really say that they're repeated and that it would be really difficult to construe how there's uh, the repetition of any forms in the world, like how we would both have eyebrows or how you would have things like platonic forms like two-ness, um, the, the fact of there being two you know, versus there being three or something like this. And his construction of this, and this is probably the most sort of maybe controversial and troubling aspect of Whitehead's thought, is how are these different from platonic forms, and are they different from platonic forms? Because he seems to also imply, or not even imply, but he makes very explicit that there is such an entity in the universe called God, and God's job is to bestow to this constant flux of the universe, the process of, of the universe, to bestow on it these possibilities for uh, taking a certain form. So God is like almost this storehouse or repository of forms. And that when a thing takes a certain form, it is taking a form offered by God or supported by God in that way. And so God plays this role in the universe. But here's the important difference. It's not like the traditional image of God creating the universe and then being like, okay, here is the universe. There will be such a thing as man with his essence as man and such a thing as woman with her essence as woman and such a thing as parakeet with its essence as parakeet and such a thing as coffee cup with his essence as coffee cup. And I will create these and lo, there they are and they're good. And here's the rules. Everybody follow my rules. It's not God imposing order from without. Rather, the universe itself chooses its forms. The flux of reality gathers in these relationships where through the uh, loving act of God's offering, they take a certain form, and then that form dissipates again. The universe is not an instance of laws imposed from outside of it by God, but rather God is the word that refers to the phenomenon of the universe forming itself in a collaborative way, in an evolutionary way. And Whitehead thinks of evolution not as a competition in the Darwinian sense, but as a collaboration where we figure out what works best. So the image is not one of the universe being made from outside and then given a bunch of rules, but creating itself from the inside, from the inside out, through partaking of forms that they pick up and then put down again. Does that make any sense at all? I'm not sure if I may be waxed to, you know, uh, ornate. <laughs> that was perfect. And, and that's really um, encapsulated, uh, I think, Whitehead's notion of the flux um, of the universe and, and how, it's, how it relates to the platonic uh, forms. And maybe this will maybe this part of the podcast or or even in relationship to my other podcast will be a bit odd because it's mostly me asking questions about stuff that I don't understand very well uh but i th I think your i think the the fact of your reply will will make it um interesting enough so so Whitehead talks about um actual entities like the subatomical particles and whatever and and he he regards that as like the bottom level of reality, which is a very standard modern scientific thinking, you know, that the lower level fully explains the upper level and that's the lower level is the real one. Uh, but the thing is that that level that's what Hat considers when you, when you reach um, top, when you reach the bottom, for, from my understanding, he doesn't regard that with ontological primacy. It, it's, it's anti-materialistic. So like, so, so how, how does that work exactly and get it how, how he inverts it yeah that's that's another good question and why wow, this is making me wish that i had like read my own dissertation more recently so that i could more adequately like face some of these things i haven't been thinking about whitehead in that much detail in a little bit but i think the way to approach that question is to 
bring up what you just brought up, which is that it's it's an it's not a materialistic philosophy. It's it's a process philosophy. It's its own kind of beast. And so when we think about actualities, we needn't think of them in terms of things. Again, not static things, but events. So an actual entity is an event. It's it's something that happens. It's an iteration of something. It's not so much, I think, a matter of there are thus and such many actual irreducible subatomic particles at a certain finite quantity existing in the universe, and so the possibilities are thus. Rather, the uh, the being of something, it's it's in insofar as it is an entity, it is an event, and it is defined by its correlation with and its collaboration with, again, to use that word, the other entities that are in play. And so its status and its being and its nature changes depending on its iteration in a given context. And the same is true of the only eternal actual entity, which is God. He's got a wonderful quote that uh, an, ex an example of an actual entity would be like um, a particle in some far off corner of the distant universe uh, in its little puff of existence. Or he says it some sort of, in the most like sort of diminutive way possible, the most diminutive thing you can imagine as like a physical event in some distant corner of the universe, like a little puff of a quark or whatever, you know, that's an actual entity, just poof. But another example of an actual entity is God. And God too, like the other actual entities, is something that changes, is a thing that changes and is a thing only insofar as it changes by virtue of the different coordinations that happen uh, as, as it interacts with the world. Um, not sure if that was clear or not, but... It was, it was. It's just that, it's just, uh, I mean, it's just such a hard way to think about it. And even for me that I've, that I've uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not at all with a good understanding of Whitehead, but at least I've heard these ideas before, at least with some superf superficiality. Uh, but even for me, it's it's just it's just hard to grasp exactly kind of how he flips the conceptual schema that uh, that you used to. Yeah, it very much does. I mean, I, I yeah, that's I think that's one of the one of the things that makes Whitehead a little difficult to or quite difficult to access, you know, at first. Um, and and you know, it I find for me that when I strive to articulate it. It's really difficult to do without lapsing into the poetic, both because that's my own sort of, you know, main squeeze in this world. It's what I spend most of my time doing, but also because it's it's it is of the like other concepts in philosophy, requires you to so radically subvert or invert your usual use of language, and you know the the language does kind of crash on the shore of the concept that you're trying to express. That's one of the things that makes him so hard. So Whitehead more or less accepts uh, platonic uh, metaphysics and, and he kind of incorporates it into his thought. He does, but with the important caveat that his version of platonic metaphysics requires a rereading of Plato and a revision of Plato. Mm -hmm. Right. So yeah. that's uh, where you're going with your question. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. Uh, well, it, it can. Uh, it, it, that that problem of interpretation kind of uh, kind of pervades kind of the the entire body of work because then you know it, it's always um, there's always the question of you know how exactly are you using Plato uh, and uh, are you using you know an actual Plato or just like your version of Plato that yeah. you just conjured up. Uh, like you know the you know the 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 Raphael painting of the School of Athens where like Aristotle's like looking down and and Plato's looking up mm -hmm. you know that one yeah and like the symbolism being that Aristotle was about what's actually going on in the world and describing it like the proto scientist or whatever and Plato was like looking at the heavens and worshiping them like it's all about you know the beyond. Uh, Whitehead would actually paint it the opposite way, uh, I, because to him. Aristotle is the one saying, hey, there's these essences that just are what they are, and they come from, it doesn't matter where they come from, just like the world has always existed, because Aristotle literally claims that, <laughs> that the universe has always existed, because it's conceptually impossible for it not to, and it has these laws that it, it operates according to where there are these different essences, and he said uh, he would have Plato looking down, because he, for him, Plato in his full maturity in the Timaeus, 
felt that the universe was a living creature choosing forms for itself and growing from from the inside as as i was saying so he is very about he's all about platonic metaphysics but not the platonic metaphysics that you learn in almost any introduction to plato right right but so he he incorporates uh these let's go let's call it white hevian platonic metaphysics um but even within his own interpretation he from my understanding he completely uh, rejects kind of not I'm not sure if it's completely but at least it it doesn't emphasize the mysticism inherent in in Plato and that that's something that's I don't know even though Whitehead has a poeticness to it um I I don't feel it has a spiritual dimension that is also moral that I think is present in, in Plato because for example the um, because uh, my, this podcast is called Anagogy Podcast in, in direct reference of the of the Anagogy ascent uh, mm -hmm. of of the cave, let's say, and when you're getting out of the cave, it's not just that you're getting contact with reality in the sense that you're having a better understanding of the metaphysics that un underlie your world. It's also a, a, a process of of self of tra transformation and, and gaining of wisdom. And those are very coupled together. Uh, but I, I, I don't see Whitehead talking about too much personal transformation. It's like he, he grabs the metaphysics and this, it has this very elaborate uh, system, but kind of wisdom is kind of gets a bit thrown out. Is, is my interpretation correct or have, a, have I? No, yeah, yeah, certainly like on, on the most basic level, that's exactly correct. It's not one of the main themes that he explores. I mean, you get glimmers of it in the sense that less so in Process and Reality, which is a highly technical book and his sort of main explication of his philosophy. Um, Adventures of Ideas has a good deal more sort of warm and fuzziness by comparison. Um, it talks about the Platonic concept of Eros, and so bringing in you know elements of love and desire, and you can see how that would start to have ethical applications, but he does not apply it to ethics. He does not apply it to psychology in any sort of substantive way. However, all of those things are underway in his legacy and in the, in the folks who have continued process thought. So process psychology is a small but you know, relevant discipline about how do, these, how do these aspects of these metaphysical aspects of reality, how do these metaphysical claims map onto and inform um, how we would pursue psychology as a discipline in terms of the construction of our identities and egos. Process theology is probably the most prominent of the legacies, actually, of process thought outside of the sciences, because so there's, there's a handful of folks, an increasing number of folks in the sciences who find Whitehead super helpful for, for orienting themselves to some of the strange aspects of modern science. But within the more sort of, uh, you know, humanity side of things, process theology is, is you know, was a big part of, of what Whitehead's legacy has been. So it's, and through the application to religion, uh, it then has its sort of ethical application. So Charles Hartshorn was a guy who took Whitehead's thought and developed process theology as such, where we're thinking more about the God aspects. And then there have been writers... For instance, John C. Cobb is one of them who applies it specifically to Christianity. And then through that avenue, it is, it, and he doesn't apply it to Christianity in a way that's exclusive to Christianity, but just shows how you, a natural theology, essentially, where God is part of nature and God is in nature, has a lot in common with other natural theologies like Spinoza, for instance. And then through that avenue, process thinking is sometimes applied to environmental ethics and to eco ecological thinking and environmental philosophy. And that to me is honestly what I'm most excited about pursuing in it because as, you know, insofar as I can claim the title of activist, that's certainly the area that I, is most important to me and most is essential to me and most urgent. And, you know, I think that's, that's where we can really benefit from this Whiteheadian thinking because it allows us to start thinking of ourselves as part of nature in a way that's really thoroughgoing but doesn't diminish our own complexity either you know and and is able to sort of get rid of some of the pernicious hierarchies that have characterized our relationship with nature and uh, give us a way to think about the structures that we in fact um, uh, exhibit 
in a way that's much more holistic. Yeah, that was very vaguely phrased, but what I mean by that is this. If you have a universe that creates itself that's choosing its own forms, you too are a chosen form, and you are a highly complex one that does have the capacity to be a steward of a natural ecosystem. You know, you, That's a, something that a, that a human being can do, but that is a way different way to look at it, saying that you're a steward that is grown from the universe growing itself than saying that you were put on earth by God since Adam and Eve, and you are the owners of the Garden of Eden, so to speak. You're the ones who are there to take care of shit because you are in charge. You're the higher life form. You're imposed from without. It's like you're plopped there. You know That's the image of the sort of uh, the imposed order on the world, that here's the world. Here is you. You were plopped there as though you're an alien by God as a human being. Now try not to fuck it up. That's how we've gotten in the environmental mess that we're in. Whiteheadian thought is about we're an outgrowth, we're part of the universe, we're of the place, and we're a very complex entity within the place. And when we say entity, we mean series of events or coordination of events, rather. And it is in our capacity, and it in fact is our capacity specifically to be a coordinator, to, to, to cooperate with and collaborate with our environment. And again, that's what evolution is. It's the ability to harmoniously collaborate and cooperate with your environment um, rather than manage it in a more hierarchical sense. So I do think that there's those applications and, and you're starting to see them you know, in certain respects. And there's sort of a pipeline through which it gets into environmental thinking. And speaking of, of the legacy of, of Whitehead, I'm, I'm not exactly sure how how the timing works out. But the impression that I have of Whitehead is kind of he's like the metaphysician that kind of kickstarts modernity of emphasizing relationships rather than viewing events and concepts in an atomized manner. Because this this thinking, even though it's 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 metaphysical in nature, it has it's so almost common sense now. Like it's everywhere in psychology and social psychology. Mm. It's like you can't think of an individual in isolation. Yeah, yeah. And like that's very Whiteheadian, even though kind of this kind of the the background of how it's applied, it's different. But it kind of the philosophy of interconnectedness. I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. Whitehead wasn't the first one to talk about this, and obviously. Uh, as you mentioned, um, kind of a, a lot of this stuff uh, comes even as far back as as Plato. Um, but I'm not exactly sure how the timing works out. But I, I see, I can't help but see whiteheads in in that aspect of culture that you've grown uh, into. Yeah, the, the, I'm I'm glad that you brought that up. I mean, I think that to be honest, I think that he was on to a lot of ideas that were also showing up in other places. And his, his, his influence has not been, certainly in a direct sense, his influence has not been as considerable as one would think, given the profundity of the insight and the importance of the way that he put it. Because the ideas are present in other thinkers. I mean, if, if we're using process philosophy in a specific sense, again, you know, the specific versus the general, that, that very precisely evokes Whitehead, but in a broader sense, people would put other thinkers in the same category. People would put Bergson in the same ca category, Henri Bergson. People would put Deleuze in the same category in many ways. And if oh. we're talking about uh, thinking that is meant to subvert traditional atomistic, as a really good word to use, atomistic categories of thinking, Deleuze is about the same critique, and Deleuze is a way more famous emissary of that idea. I think way more people have read Deleuze than have and, read Whitehead. Sorry, uh, how, also... how does how does Deleuze uh, fit with Whitehead historically? I'm very bad with those dates of the 20th, 20th century. Um, so Deleuze was publishing after Whitehead. I feel like Deleuze's books probably come out in like the middle of the century, even like the 60s, right? Is that correct? He was born in 1925. So yep. that's you know when process around around when process and reality was uh, published, and yeah, Deleuze was publishing from the 1950s up until the 90s, and so the, a lot of the ideas are really similar. I think they were way more effective, just accidentally anyway, in making it into 
ethical discussions and making it into uh, sort of the general climate of thinking of progressive thinkers, um, whether they're philosophers with metaphysical interests or um, you know activists or whatever, um, because that. But both things are about saying no process rather than static form, difference rather than sameness, uh, coordination and relationship rather than fixity and law. Uh, and they're very, very similar. There's, there's a great, um, I forget where I heard this. I really should look it up and find it because it's a wonderful way to think of it. Deleuze is in a more distinct way associated with deconstruction, not deconstruction in the, in the specific like literary sense, let's say, but, but the critical edge of going, okay, we need to break down how our ideological structures are put together. We need to break down how reality is and see what's really going on. And it's critical. It's constantly saying um, order has been imposed on you, on your psyche, and we need to, we need to dissolve it somehow. You could almost say that uh, Deleuze is an example of postmodern deconstructivism, where you're breaking things down, or he's associated with that. And Whiteheadian philosophy is an example of postmodern constructivism. It's showing how things are made, but they're both getting at the same thing. And it's like different flavors. And I might be wrong to put Deleuze like in that camp. That's not exhaustive of Deleuze. I'm also not an expert in Deleuze, but you know, I'm mostly familiar with difference and repetition and with, uh, you know, with the work with Watari. Um, but the, uh, the let, let's just generalize it to that, that both like postmodern deconstructivism, if we say that, I think there's, you know, both of us uh, mutual understanding there of what we mean, like, you know, that that critical aspect of let's break down the ideologies, let's break down these like apparent structures and get down to the flux that's really there. And in emphasis, though, it is critical. It's about breaking down what's there. It's antagonistic in terms of how it presents itself aesthetically. And its emphasis points um, in terms of what it really wants to attack and talk about it. And it's very wrapped up with Marxism and the critique of capital and the critique of uh, you know, gender concepts. And it's all part of that same sort of continuum. Process philosophy, on the other hand, doesn't really come from that tradition in terms of its emphasis. It's got a different sort of angle on it, but it really is talking about the same thing. And so if you view it just as a broad stroke sort of comparison, postmodern deconstructivism versus constructivism. And I would argue that in a way we need more of that latter, you know, because again, you know, I'm somebody who's very much on the left in pretty much every respect politically. And I'm very much about, you know, deconstructing gender roles and like, you know, I'm all, I'm all that, that, those are all my banners that I wave, but I am tired of constantly breaking down those who don't want to hear about it. And maybe a better strategy just at, uh, in terms of emphasis and aesthetics is go like, let's look at how things are made. And the fact that they are made, you know, and that we make them and that the universe makes them. And then it has less in common with, uh, you know, like Marxist critique and antagonism and more in common with um, religion, you know, with, 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 with animistic religion, with, with um, deeply spiritual practice uh, and, and meditation and stuff like that. You know, I've thrown a lot of things now into the mix, <laughs> a little, in a little no, bit no, of a that... fashion, but. That that was that was beautiful. Uh, I, I really like it. Um, this this like this construction versus versus deconstruction that's actually super interesting. And I, I never uh, thought about uh, thought about it in those terms. And, and it also has a, a dimension of like a, one is more kind of cosmological, while kind of Deleuze and a lot of his French friends uh, were, mm -hmm. were were more concerned about the social and so they yeah they're, they're kind of trying to tr trying to cover two different dimensions but i still think the the oppositional dynamics the, the, that that still holds and that's that's a very good way to put it i think you know on a you know and again since this whole question stemmed from you 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 were thinking about whitehead's influence like one of the claims that i sort of make in my dissertation and this is a little bit difficult to defend you know ironically but i think that just by accident, by associating him so, himself so much with Plato and because he was so fascinated by Plato, but it was his own version of Plato 
is one of the main sources of the misunderstanding of Whitehead and one of the main reasons that his legacy didn't take off the way it did. Because among other choices in terms of how he presents himself, he sounds very antiquarian just in voice in many ways. He sounds like he points backward. And the fact that it's so laden with Plato makes him subject to a lot of misunderstanding because for Deleuze, in many ways, Plato is public enemy number one. He's, he's the main problem. He's the symbol of the problem. And then Whitehead uses Plato as his symbol, but it's not what people associate with Plato. You know, <laughs> it's, it's just, it's super, it's an ironic choice on, because most people are dealing with a superficial reading of Plato or reading of Plato that is much more couched in the Republic that misconstrues the whole thing. And so Whitehead, I think, made his philosophy harder to access by virtue of that allegiance, you know? Man, th- th- there has been several, uh, several angles to this conver- t- conversation that has made me uh, want to bring uh, Heidegger up uh, mm. n- now because of the kind of like h- how Plato uh, plays a role on, mm-hmm. on, on the philosopher's work and Whitehead kind of serving as a foundation even though he's on interpretation and lose against it. And th- that was kind of how Heidegger was about it as well. And also I thought about Heidegger when you were talking about environmentalism as well. Uh, but that would open a can of worms. So I'm trying not to get it because this is uh, getting a bit long. So I just want to uh, mention my desire, but I'm going to reject it. And I'm going to give you one last question so I don't take... Uh, too much of your time, uh, which is, I really liked when you talked about uh, systematic versus uh, unsystematic uh, thought, um, which for me, it was, a, it was a bit weird because I, I never, I mean, I, I understand the concepts, but I've never seen it uh, applied in that way. And, and certainly not uh, Whitehead's and Plato with the unsystematic ones. Uh, to me, intuitively, it's actually uh, quite the opposite. Uh, but maybe you can uh, explain uh, a little bit um, about that. And also, actually, let, let's let, let's get to uh, unpacking that uh, a little bit, um, and then I'll kind of develop on that. I think that's easier. Yeah, it shows up as a theme in my dissertation because uh, it's a thing that Whitehead brings up, and... Whitehead is, in bringing it up, comparing Plato and Aristotle, sort of along the lines that we are right now. Plato as somebody who plays with ideas, and Aristotle as somebody who systematizes ideas. And in the context that he brings it up, it's really not even a value judgment between the two. Both are important um, in the history of, of ideas, and both are valid in their way. And then that distinction also maps onto a comparison that Whitehead implies, or that we find evidenced biographically between himself and his student and collaborator, Bertrand Russell, there's like a really wonderful like parallelism that goes on um, where Bert- Bertrand Russell was working under Whitehead and then they worked together on the Principia Mathematica, um, which was this you know mathematical and logical uh, project that we won't talk about because it's way too big of a topic. But um, the same distinction as exists between Plato and his student Aristotle exists between Whitehead and his sometimes student Russell, which is that... Uh, Whereas Plato wanted to sort of play, Aristotle wanted to systematize, and Whitehead sort of suggests the same thing. He says, you, Russell, um, view the world differently than I. I see in the world um, a hazy sort of flux of – he uses the phrase higgledy-piggledy, which is like some sort of anglicism that I've never heard in either context. Like a a willy-nilly, just like messed up, you know – weird fuzzy world you know that's what whitehead sees it's a world of weirdness and strange interconnection and webs and a jungle and you russell see the world as uh one on which the sun shines with mediterranean clarity he makes the the that's the phrase like it's you know if you know when you're in the mediterranean all the lines are very sharp because the sun is so bright and there's this there's a cloudless sky and you see the clearly defined lines of you know the rock formation over there and the tree over there and then the column over here, you know what I mean, that, that we've built. And that, those, that clear, those clear systems and clear um, definitions. And Whitehead, ironically, as you point out, puts himself in the non-systematic camp, the one, the one who's, who wants to just play with ideas, which if you're reading Process and Reality as main work, you would think is, is total hogwash because it's a highly systematic work. It's very systematic. But his other works are different. And I think actually 
Adventures of Ideas is a better explication of his ideas in some ways than process and reality is. It's for a little bit more of a, it's much less technical um, because it is more about play. There's many different ways to put things and there's many different systems, just as there's many different ways metaphysically for organisms to assume and then dispose of the forms that they take and they take them all temporarily. So just as there's a collaborative and uh, exploratory and subjective nature to the very fabric of reality, where the fundamental aspect of reality, the fundamental aspect of reality is process and experience. Things are experiencing their coming to be in a form. So is philosophy experiential. And so is philosophy a play of ideas. And this brings us full circle then to this fallacy of misplaced concreteness. Don't mistake your theories for actualities. They're descriptions. They too come to be and pass away again in the passage of conversation, which brings us again in turn to Plato, whose philosophy was explicated in the form of conversation that came to be and then passed away again as you read the book. You know About this systematic... Um form of whiteheads is something that's made me really think about it is how this this needs for system seems kind of like a symptom or an outcome i don't even know of like rationalism and modernity which kind of which i think kind of kind of peaked with hegel of like having this insane system that tries to uh, explain everything and encompass everything um, and I see some connections with that with uh, secular culture and mysticism because the more you encompass, the less room there is for mysticism and, and, and the mystery and, mm -hmm. and the sacred even. And I, I noticed this with Whitehead because Whitehead, as I, as I kind of argued a, a bit before, he kind of pushes this kind of mm. mysticism way but in my opinion it's precisely the the denial of a system where this this sacredness is because it has always been associated uh with kind of the border of knowledge and kind of beyond of what you can yeah. speak of and, and whitehead is in this position where he wants to kind of not make reality uh, rigid, but at the same time, in my opinion, he kind of doesn't take advantage of of the ultimate meaning of of what that entails. I don't know if that makes any sense. Can you explicate that very last sentence a little bit more? That he doesn't take advantage because, of the ultimate meaning of what that entails. Because. I, I want to try not to sound too theological, but because precisely that God can't be captured is because it's 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 beyond your ability to categorize it, to systematize it. And Whitehead is like, well, the universe is is a play that is that is beyond um, a system, but he kind of this misses the mystery it's kind of like there's 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 not there's nothing sacred because there's nothing moral in a in a white headian system i don't i don't mean that in the sense that he's like no see yeah i i, I don't know if i would agree with that because i would say that it's true that as a writer and in terms of what he thematizes he does not go in very frequently or deeply to concepts of the sacred or into ethics or anything like that. But I think he makes ample room for it. And I think he's, I think he's very cognizant of that sacredness. I mean, if the most immediate reason being that he goes to the trouble, unlike other, uh, uh, you know, deconstructive philosophers of giving God a role in the system. And, and that it's, it's not just, because he needs some sort of special entity. It's like given the capital G God character a role is like a very significant gesture. And so in, in many ways, it becomes similar to highly mystical systems where you view 
God's role in reality as being an experiential one and one that you access, that we all participate in. We're all constantly in communion with God insofar as we live and breathe and exist and change. God, in fact, offers us the precondition for change and alteration and evolution and growth. And, and we're constantly in interface with that. Now, he doesn't go into it in a mystical sense of poeticizing what this means for your life or how this can set you free from your addictions or something like that. Although, like I said, there are applications of that in later process thought that draws directly on Whitehead. Whitehead just didn't happen to explore it. But it's, it's very much in there. I mean, uh, maybe I can pull it up really quick. Um, you know, if we're, if we're looking for the most mystical parts of, uh, of Whitehead. Okay, here we go. Um, so there's a series of antitheses that he offers in process and reality, and they go like this. And it almost reminds me of like a mythical, or excuse me, a mystical incantation. Um, it is as true to say that God is permanent and the world fluent as that the world is permanent and God is fluent. It is as true to say that God is one and the world many as that the world is one and God many. It is as true to say in comparison with the world God is an actual is actual eminently as that in comparison with God the world is actual eminently. It is as true to say that the world is imminent in God as that God is imminent in the world. It is as true to say that God transcends the world as that the world transcends God. It is as true to say that God creates the world as that the world creates God. What is done in the world is transformed into a reality in heaven, and the reality in heaven passes back into the world. In this sense, God is the great companion, the fellow sufferer who understands. I mean, that sounds like something that's out of like Meister Eckhart or something, you know what I mean? So it, it is there. And this, this sense that it's the same sentence to say, or it's as true to say, God creates the world as that the world creates God. That sounds like classic mystical parallelism, you know what I mean? And so it is there. Like he, he, he goes there. It's just not one of the main themes. And what one encounters when one first cracks Whitehead open is just bizarrely technical mumbo jumbo. <laughs> Okay, that's that's a a perfect ending. Like, uh, I'm 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 kind of craving to kind of unpack that a little bit more because I've noticed that the way you view kind of a spiritual dimension of a cosmological view of the world that is present in Whitehead is has a different spiritual connotation than it the than it does for me, and that it'd be very interesting to t kind of try to explore where those differences uh, come from. Uh, but th that was a really uh, good way uh, to end it. And I, I just want to thank you for, for coming. And this was an amazing conversation. Yeah, the pleasure is mutual. I, I, that, that was one of the best conversations I've had in, in quite some time. It was really, really very, very gratifying. So I appreciate you. Awesome. So uh, just one last thing. Uh, would it be okay if I put like one of your songs at the end of the podcast so that people can... Absolutely. Please do. Yeah. What what one do you want to put? Um, I, I can't remember the title now, but but I was thinking uh, one of the earliest ones that you have in your channel about um, where did this shit come from? Something like that? Or what is it made of? Oh, how, how is it? How the fuck this fucking shit works? Yeah, exactly. That was That's one of yeah, my yeah. favorite ones. No, that that would be perfect. That, that that actually is about a lot of the stuff that we're talking about in its way. So, um, yeah, that that would be great. Um, and uh, yeah, I was gonna yeah, I was gonna say that'd be cool to like have have a link that people can go follow and, and yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, feel free to 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 say like where people can find you and yeah. stuff like that. I'll I'll send some links later today. But Tiago, thank you so much. I, I really just appreciate you. That, that was really enjoyable. It's my pleasure. And to everyone watching, uh, I've lately heard that apparently. Um, Apple podcast reviews are really important apparently so if you use that and you want to leave a review of the podcast um, that would really be helpful and also I've launched a, a website for the podcast lately uh, if you want to check it out it's uh, anagogypodcast.com uh, it just has the episodes uh, laid out there like there's nothing special but if you want to check other episodes and maybe you want to see a quick way to look it up in all the platforms feel free to check it out and that's all I have thank you very much Nathan and have a great day Thank you. See bye you later. Bye-bye.
Do you ever find yourself wondering how the fuck fucking shit works? Like all the shit in the whole fucking universe, how does it work? Now it's clear there's a bunch of fucking shit going on. A bunch of fucking shit is on fire. A bunch of other shit is underwater. There's a bunch of fucking shit going down and a bunch of it is fucked up as shit. Sometimes people are even fucking up each other's shit. And that shit is fucked up. And the question of what to do about that shit is deeply related to the question of how the fuck it works in the first place. It's a topic of significant debate and complex historical development. But if you do sometimes ask what the fuck to do about shit, and if that question leads you to the greater question of the origin of all the fucking shit ever and what its ultimate essence and purpose is, you wouldn't be the first to ask. You see, people have been wondering how the fuck shit works since before there was fuck shit or any other words, the function of which were to give names to objects and find a latent order in the sprawling chaoticness. Oh shit, it's fire. It's bright at night. Look, I don't know where it came from, but now I can cook. It's from a higher power. I'ma write that in a book. I'ma praise it for millennia. That's how long it took until it occurred to me that the person that I'm worshiping can't account for all the phenomena I'm observing quite perfectly. And I gazed at my fire and whatever it was crying up, and I thought perhaps its flame was made of elemental fire stuff, and water's made of water stuff, and earth is made of earth stuff, and air is made of air, and I and all I've ever heard of are made from these two, being just some conglomerates of parts and holes, particles of a bunch of other smaller shit. But how small shit get? Is shit infinitely divisible, or are big and small balanced by some kind of invisible power, or is it random and at bottom inert? In short, how the fuck does fucking shit work? It was heard in the cave and the hut and the yurt. How the fuck does fucking shit work? Plato thought the universe was a living organism, a unitary animal with spirit, form, and vision. He got it from Pythagoras, who got it from Egyptians, who got it from a mashup of observations and religions that sprawl into the vastness of history's distance. And if it seems to be just an idiotic inference, it isn't. All I know is life. It is my principal condition. Life is all I am, and from it I am arisen. So why would I assume that other shit within the system at which I look and listen isn't in the same position? I grow, trees grow, our forms are rearranged, winds and oceans blow and flow as if with conscious conscientious change. There's nothing that I know that doesn't sometimes do it. So all is soul and light, for all is right with movement. It's a beautiful construction. It hits you like a bullet, but just because it's beautiful doesn't mean it isn't bullshit. Saying there's a giant fucking spirit that pervades stuff doesn't help explain why anything happens the way it does. Like if you want a tree's help, you don't have to ask it. You can turn it into firewood if you have a good hatchet. And knowing how to hack it is what we call common sense, which is ultimately a knowledge of physical processes with no real regard for their life or your conscience or why we're both here or where the hell God is. And when the question of how it works takes precedence over why it is, one locates the basis of the modern physical sciences, which describe how things are and not what they mean and sees the parts of this world as the parts of a machine. Nothing good about it. Also nothing evil. Nothing very meaningful about people or free will. Not to say most materialist amoralists are jerks. They're not, but I'm not sure how the fuck that works. Is it all a big soul or a bunch of freaking dirt? How the fuck does fucking shit work? Newton supposed that a god that's all-knowing conceived the world machine and then set the ball rolling, such that anyone who knows all the relevant conditions within a physical system could make accurate predictions of all possible events. And so even without God, knowing what the fuck's what becomes an approachable job. Stats, past, and futures, and there's nothing actually mystic in this universe that's absolutely deterministic. But further observation of really, really tiny stuff suggested that conception still wasn't quite fine enough. For subatomic particles whose masses are mad small don't behave in accordance with the common sense facts at all. And we can make guesses about how they'll act later, but they seem to express a lot of random behavior. And if the parts that comprise things just kind of do whatever, then what the fuck holds all of the larger stuff together? And what makes them gather just so in their random ball? Is there some supernatural shit happening after all? How the fuck does fucking shit work? Now what we have is intellectual unrest, the inevitable result of knowing Dick Bupkis, wondering not just what, but even if stuff is, and when we hear an answer, fearing to trust it. And we're back once more to our former condition, but with much less faith and less fucks given. Whether anyone can answer the old inquisition of what the fuck's happening and is anyone listening? And next to the question what the nature of matter is, is the question of just what's at stake when we're asking it. Is the universe for our use or are we its tools? The answers are opaque and the askers are fools. Is the earth other than us self-balancing steadily? Or is she our mother and we're fucking her edibly? And is it just in reference to us that she's precious? And which comes first? The physics or the ethics. I hope you didn't think that I would tell you what the answer is. I'll probably forget that I was asking it after this. The fact is I'm alive. I'ma live on Earth. I'ma figure out a way to make this fucking shit work. How the fuck does fucking shit work? How the fuck 
this fucking shit work? How the fuck this fucking shit work? How the fuck this fucking shit work? How the fuck does this fucking shit work? Huh? How the fuck this fucking shit work? How the fuck this fucking shit work? How the fuck this fucking shit work? How the fuck does this fucking shit work? And how do I get paid for asking that? <laughs>